today I'm going to talk about a pendulum on a spring-loaded moving mass and you see the pendulum here that is attached to the mass the mass is moving on a frictionless table and the mass has two springs attached to it one on the left and one on the right the mass is moving back and forth in a horizontal way and the pendulum can swing back and forth like so yeah so it can swing both in the x positive x and in the positive or negative y direction and also in the positive or negative x direction okay gravity is part of the equation here and what i would like to do is i would like to solve the equations of motion using the lagrangian method okay so when we want to do that we have to determine first what the generalized coordinates will be and in this case there are two generalized coordinates there's an x for the movement of this mass where direction to the right is considered positive like i indicated here and there's a theta that can move the pendulum back and forth so there are two generalized coordinates theta and x yeah indicated over here and as a consequence the infinitesimal movements are delta x and delta theta there's no generalized force in it at all because there's for instance no friction here it's a frictionless surface there are no dampening systems in here so all the generalized forces are zero and there's no external force in this picture either except for gravity okay so no generalized forces so that brings us to the Lagrangian how can we calculate the Lagrangian the Lagrangian is a combination of the kinetic energy T and the potential energy V so let's start with the kinetic energy and let's start with the kinetic energy of the mass on top here that moves back and forth on the table and that's only determined by the speed of this mass in a half m v squared type of way so this kinetic energy is really simple to calculate because there's only one direction this mass can move it can move back and forth so you will immediately get a half m x dot squared this to determine the kinetic energy of the pendulum mass we need to go a little bit further than that so let's start with calculating the position of this this mass at all times and in order to do that I'm going to split it up in an x and in a y direction therefore we have a factor big xt which determines the location of the mass on the pendulum is built up in the x direction of an x t because it is attached to the mass here plus a little piece that moves back and forth right so it's L sine theta which is this little piece if you move it an angle theta that the pendulum will move also on top of the movement X so you get X plus L sine theta for the X movement of the pendulum mass here okay and obviously there's an L cosine theta this piece here from the center all the way up to here to the center of the mass there for the vertical movement since y and x are positive you both have positives here okay so now we have the position of this mass hanging on the pendulum so we can differentiate that to get uh, the speed and let's do that so we start with xt differentiating that becomes x dot then we start to differentiate as a next step sine fine uh, sine theta and that becomes sine becomes a cosine theta. theta theta depends on the time so you have to also according to the chain rule differentiate with respect to t so you get d theta dt which is theta dot here and you do the same for the for the y term so you get minus l theta dot sine theta okay so now we have the speed and we can again try to calculate the kinetic energy of the pendulum mass mp which is a half m v dot v and that's a half m x dot dot x dot and that's the x dot we calculated here that's the speed at any time the inertial speed at any time of the pendulum mass so you have to quadratize this part and you have to quadratize that part you add them up you simplify and you get this expression and that's then the kinetic energy of the mass hanging on the pendulum okay and since you have 
cosine and sine squared terms here. You can add those up and you get a little bit simpler expression here for the kinetic energy. So now the total kinetic energy is the sum of the two. So this one plus this one will be added here. And now we have a term for the total energy, total kinetic energy of the system. And that's depicted over here. So our next step is to calculate the potential energy. Okay. So for clarity, I copied the kinetic energy term one more time. And let's take a look at the potential energy term. So there's a spring here, which is only being moved by this uh, generalized coordinate X because it has been mounted to ground on the left-hand side. So you immediately get a half K X squared according to Hooke's law. Same for the one on the right. You also get a half K X squared for the spring on the right hand side because it's also mounted here. Okay, so it can only be moved also by X. So you get a half K X squared there also. And then you have the potential energy of the mass hanging on the pendulum and that's minus MGL cosine theta. That's exactly this piece here, right? This length you have to take. So now we can subtract T and V to get the Lagrangian. So we take the Lagrangian, T minus V, we take the Lagrangian, the T we already calculated here, we subtract this value from it, minus Kx squared, two of these, with a minus there, and you get the total Lagrangian over here. So we're, we're good on our way already to get the equations of motion. So our next step is to get actually equations of motions out. So again, I copied the Lagrangian here, for reference, I also copied the generalized forces, which were both zero. And I copied the Lagrange equation here. So this is the equation we need to calculate for the two variables, for x and for theta. Yeah, those are the two generalized variables. So we start with the first one, the x dot. Uh, so we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to x dot. That gives you here 2mx dot that you need to differentiate towards the time so you get 2mx double dot okay there's another x dot here so you get if you differentiate it the Lagrangian with respect to that one you get lm theta dot cosine theta okay so that's what you get there and that you have to again differentiate towards time and if you do that you differentiate that towards time you get cosine becomes minus sine, that's this term here, and the theta you obviously have to differentiate again with respect to, uh, to time, so you get another theta dot in there, so you get minus lm theta dot squared sinus theta, sine theta, okay? So that's the first one with, with respect to x. Okay, and then we go to um, the second one in X we go to this term and we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to X here and what you see there of course is that you get another term which is 2k X okay so that's the first one first equation now we go to the second equation <coughs> And we start differentiating towards theta dot. And if you do that, and you differentiate towards dt, and you subtract the, the Lagrange with respect to theta here, you work it out, you get this equation. Yeah, it's, it's straightforward algebra, it's tedious, but it's not hard. And it gives you this equation of motion. So now we have two equations of motion here. And if you look carefully, they are non-linear, right? There are cosine terms in there, sine term theta, theta dot squared, and all that stuff. So it's pretty non-linear. So what we're going to try to do next is try to linearize it. And that's being done here. So I copied again for reference the two solutions. Now we're going to assume that theta is really small. And that results in that sine theta is about theta. If theta is really small, you can do a Taylor expansion around zero and you, would, you will see that sine theta is indeed the same as theta if theta is really small. 
And for cosine theta, it's about one if theta is really small. So if you substitute those values, and in addition to that, you assume that this value is really small compared to this value, so you can take that out completely, you will end up with two linear differential equations. This is the first one, 2m x double dot plus lm theta double dot plus 2kx. And there is the second one, which is x double dot plus l theta double dot plus g theta equals zero. And you can see that those equations are intertwined. So it's not that straightforward to solve them. Okay. But we're going to use an interesting uh, method from linear algebra to actually solve it. The first step we will do is we take these two equations and we put them in matrix form, what you see here. Okay, and this is exactly the same as what you see here, no difference. You can work it out, 2m times x double dot, that's this term, plus ml times theta double dot is this term, plus 2k times x is this term, and that equals to zero. That's that term, and also for the other one. Okay, so if you look at this matrix representation, you see that this one is already diagonalized, and you can diagonalize this one, and if you do that, you get two independent linear second order differential equations that you can easily solve. So that's what we will do. And we will do that by calculating the eigenfunctions of this matrix, and we denote them by V, we put them in a matrix, and we denote them by V, so you get two eigenvectors here, so you also get a two by two matrix, and that one is denoted by phi. So now if you multiply the inverse of phi times A, the original matrix here, times V, you get the diagonal matrix over here. So the diagonal matrix will contain the eigenvalues of this matrix A here. Okay? So you are allowed, by the way, to multiply from the left with phi minus 1 here. You can do that. You cannot multiply automatically by phi to the right here, but what you can do is you can say, I'm going to multiply by phi, phi minus 1, because that's an identity that's allowed. And then you still get this term in, which is the diagonal matrix. Okay? You do the same on the second term. <coughs> okay? Where B is this matrix over here. So if you do that, what you will get is you get a diagonal matrix here, which is D, you get a diagonal matrix here, which is still B, because if it is diagonalized, it doesn't matter if you multiply by a phi minus 1 and a phi, because you can just pull it through and you get the identity. So that's still B. And you get a new set of variables, namely phi minus 1 times x dot. And the x dot here is x double dot is x double dot theta double dot. That's here. But now you get a new set of variables, and I call them y1, y2. Yeah, so this is essentially a 1 by 2 vector with y1 double dot and y2 double dot. With your diagonalized matrix here, plus b, which is also diagonalized, times y, and that equals 0. This is now two independent differential equations. And you can solve them immediately, right? You get sines and cosines. You don't get exponents that decay because there's no, nothing decaying in the system here. So you get something like something with sines and cosines out of it. When you want now to re regain back xt and theta t, you have to multiply y that you calculated from here. And you have to multiply that by v, which are the eigenvectors of this matrix. Okay? And when you do that, you get xt and theta t out of it. And that's what you see over here. Now, if you do that, and I did this with Mathematica, it becomes really huge and really bulky. And I looked at the equation and I said, okay, I'm going to make some simplifications so we can at least see the physics that comes out of it. So I assumed, going forward, that m is the same as k. So the mass of these two objects is the same in value, absolute value, as the k values of the springs. And I also assumed that g, which is 9.81, yeah, gravitation, gravitational acceleration on the Earth, 
that is the same as the length of the pendulum here. So it's a very long pendulum. So it moves really slowly and it's really long. Okay, so I assumed that. By looking at the equations, I could see that that would result in a lot of simplifications. I also assumed four initial conditions. There are two generalized variables. They are both second order differential equations. So you need four initial conditions to describe the system. In order to do that, I assumed x at time is zero equals zero. So there's no movement of this thing at t is zero. And the speed is also zero. So this thing is really absolutely sitting still at t is zero. The only disturbance I'm going to bring into the system is I'm going to take the pendulum, I'm going to lift it up a little bit and I'm going to release it. And then I'm going to see what happens. So that means that the speed, the angular velocity is also zero, but there is angular movement here and I call that alpha. Okay, so at t is zero, I disturb the system with an angle alpha here and then I let it go and then I see what happens. And that's what we see here. So if you solve now for x and for theta, you get these formulas. And you see that this is a combination of cosines in this case, and here also on the theta side. Now let's see if that makes sense. At t is zero, it better be that x is zero. So let's fill that out, t is zero. You get one minus one, which is indeed zero. Let's fill it out here also. You get one plus one equals two, divided by 2 times alpha. Yes, that's indeed what we initially set as being the uh, disturbance. Okay, so that's alpha there. And what you can see is that there is no dampening in the system either, right? It's just a cosine and sine. And if as soon as I release that thing, it will go on forever. This will start to swing back and forth and this will start to go back and forth. And it will go on forever because there's no friction in the system. There are no... Uh, non-conservative forces in the system so it will not dampen right there are no dampeners in the system either so the system will simply not dampen and will go on forever okay i think this is a great place to stop if you like this video please subscribe and please like and i'll see you in the next one